Today's case takes us to Warren, Massachusetts. The town has a population of about 5,100 people. Located an hour west of Boston, Warren offers a nice contrast to the fast pace of the big city. From what I could find, this is a peaceful community with hardly any crime. Most of the town's residents are families, and while there isn't too much to do in Warren, you don't have to venture very far to find great shopping and other entertainment. In the year 2000, Warren is home to 16-year-old Molly Bish. For the most part, Molly is a regular American teen. She attends Quaybog Regional High School, where she's an honors student. Fellow classmates say that Molly is a friendly person that loves to make others laugh. Her positive and uplifting energy has gained her many friends at Quaybog High. Molly is also a seasoned athlete. Her favorite sport is soccer, but she's just as skilled in basketball and softball. When she isn't in school or playing sports, Molly loves listening to music and goes shopping for shoes whenever possible. Overall, this is a well-rounded and goal-oriented teenager enjoying life. The summer of 2000 was set to be very exciting for Molly. She had gotten a job as a lifeguard down at Cummins Pond. This was a popular swimming location for residents of Warren. Molly was excited for the opportunity. Those close to her say that she took this summer job very serious. Since the lifeguard shift started in the morning, her mother, Maggie, would drop her off at the lake on her way to work. The arrangement worked out great, and Molly seemed to be doing well at her new job. June 27, 2000 started early for Molly Bish. This was the first day of summer swim lessons down at Cummins Pond. It was crucial that she be at her post on time that day. Since Molly has her learner's permit, Maggie allows her to drive that morning. On the way, they stop at the Warren Police Station. Here, Molly picks up her two-way radio. It was approximately 10 a.m. when the two finally arrived at Cummins Pond. Molly was in a hurry, but took a moment to hug and kiss her mother. She then jumped out the car and walked towards her post. Within a matter of minutes, swimmers began arriving for the day's lesson, but they saw no lifeguard on duty. One concerned mother walked over to check near the post. She saw a pair of sandals, a whistle, and a two-way radio. It seemed that someone had been there, but they must have just stepped away. Wanting to get the swim lessons underway, the mother took the whistle and assumed duty as the lifeguard. Using the two-way radio, she also contacted Molly's boss and let him know there was no lifeguard present. Initially, Molly's boss just assumed she had abandoned her job, and in that case, it was protocol for him to notify the Warren police. When officers got this call, they too felt that Molly had walked off her post. After all, this was the summertime. Maybe she was off somewhere hanging with friends. They believed Molly would be back before the day was over, so they decided to wait it out and see what would happen. But after three hours passed, there was still no sign of Molly. By now, Warren police decided it was best to call her parents. When Maggie received news of her daughter's absence, she was puzzled. It wasn't like Molly to neglect her lifeguard duties, so if she wasn't at the pond, something must be wrong. Maggie voiced her concerns to the Warren police. They still felt that Molly was with friends and would soon return. Maggie vehemently rejected that theory, and after seeing the way Molly's things were left at her post, she begged authorities to do something. Sensing the concern in Maggie's voice, Warren police sprung into action. Within days, multiple law enforcement agencies were involved in a search for the missing teenager. Early on, it was thought that Molly could have drowned in the waters of Cummins Pond. This was a stretch considering Molly was a very experienced swimmer. Still, police decided to search the pond. This effort turned up no signs of Molly, but with the theory of drowning ruled out, Police begin to think that this was a case of abduction. But who could have taken Molly in those few minutes after she got to work? Well, that question jogged a memory for Maggie Bish. On the day prior to Molly's disappearance, Maggie dropped her daughter off at work as usual. When the two got to Cummins Pond, 
Maggie noticed a white car sitting in the parking lot. Inside, a dark-haired man with a thick mustache sat smoking a cigarette. As Molly got out to grab her things, the man stared and watched her every move. Meanwhile, Maggie is watching all of this and the man's demeanor is making her uncomfortable. She decides to walk down to the water and help Molly set up her post. The two chatted for a while and killed some time. Maggie hoped that the strange man would now be gone. To her surprise, he was still sitting in his car when she got back to the parking lot. Maggie got into her vehicle, but didn't start the engine. Instead, she pretended to dig through her purse and wait for the man to leave. After a few minutes, he did just that. For the time being, Maggie felt some relief, but when her daughter went missing the next day, this man was the first person she thought of. A sketch artist developed a composite of the mysterious man. Once the picture was released to the media, tips began to pour in. There seemed to be several people that fit the man's description. Furthermore, a number of witnesses saw that same white car in the area the day Molly disappeared. Authorities followed every tip they could, but none led to any solid answers. While the man in the white car remains a person of interest, he's never been identified. With weeks having passed, the Bish family remained hopeful that Molly was out there somewhere. With the lack of good leads, police began to turn their attention to those in her inner circle. Pretty soon, there was a new person on their radar. Prior to going missing, Molly had a boyfriend named Steve Lucas. They had only been dating for a few months, so the relationship was fresh. Friends and family could recall no drama between the two, but police felt that Steve acted a little odd after Molly went missing. They claimed he was not very cooperative during the investigation, and when it came time to search for Molly, he didn't really participate. Once the Bish family found out police were looking at Steve, they were quick to defend him. They felt that the abduction was the act of a stranger, someone that knew the area well and planned the abduction for some time. For them, it was less than likely that Steve could have been that person. Still, police brought the young man in for a polygraph. When the results came back, it showed that Steve was telling the truth. After this, police officially ruled him out as a suspect. As weeks turned into months, the investigation into Molly's disappearance grew in intensity. With the number of law enforcement agencies involved, this would become the largest and most expensive search effort in the state's history. It seemed that every news station was covering the story. It was even profiled on Unsolved Mysteries, 48 Hours, and America's Most Wanted. On the ground, police deployed helicopters, canines, and on-foot search parties. Even volunteers set up their own private parties to help out. And no matter where you went in Massachusetts, you were sure to see Molly's picture posted. Clearly, there were a lot of people out there that wanted to bring the missing girl home. But with no clues or helpful tips, the investigation was growing colder by the day. By the summer of 2003, there's far less detectives assigned to Molly's case, but it does remain open and active. Around this time, they start to believe that Molly's disappearance may be related to another Massachusetts kidnapping. Holly Peranian disappeared in August of 1993. She was in the city of Sturbridge, Massachusetts to visit her grandparents. One morning, she and her brother went to a neighbor's house to look at some puppies. The brother returned, but Holly didn't. A search was executed and just two months later, Holly's remains were found. To this day, the killer has never been identified. In 1993, Molly Bish and Holly Peranian were the same age, and Sturbridge is only 10 miles from Warren. Police felt this was enough to visit the area and question some of the locals. Detectives would end up speaking to a hunter that lived in Sturbridge. He said that a couple months earlier, he had seen a blue bathing suit in a wooded area out in Palmer, another Massachusetts town not far from Warren. At the time, 
He thought it was strange that a bathing suit would be in that area, but he didn't think to call police. Knowing that Molly was last seen wearing a blue bathing suit, detectives headed to Palmer immediately. A search of the forest was conducted, and within days, the blue bathing suit was found. Police continued to search the area while running DNA tests on the clothing. Once those results came back, it was indeed confirmed that the blue bathing suit did belong to Molly. On one hand, police now knew that they were on the right track. On the other hand, it had become evident that something bad had happened to Molly. And on June 9, 2003, those fears were confirmed. That afternoon, police discovered the remains of Molly Bish. Her body was found in the forest of Palmer, Massachusetts, just five miles from Cummins Pond. Sadly, there was no way to determine how Molly died. However, her manner of death was ruled a homicide. This news was a devastating blow to the Bish family. They'd spent all these years praying for Molly's safe return. Though they would now have closure, it was the worst type imaginable. It's been almost 20 years since Molly's body was discovered. In that time, there have been no arrests in the case. Though police have looked into several suspects, there's been no evidence to link any of them to the crime. Currently, there's a $100,000 reward for any information leading to the culprit. As of 2022, Molly's story continues to circulate on true crime blogs and podcasts. Perhaps in time, We'll learn who was responsible for this horrific murder. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you found this story interesting, click here to check out another case.